My Family and Other Animals by Gerald Durrell Part 1 There is a pleasure sure in being mad, which none but madmen know. Dryden, The Spanish Friar Part 2 The Migration July had been blown out like a candle by the biting wind that ushered in a leaden August sky. A sharp stinging drizzle fell billowing into opaque grey sheets when the wind caught it. Along the Bournemouth seafront, the beach huts turned blank wooden faces towards a greeny grey froth-chained sea that leapt eagerly at the cement bulwark of the shore. The gulls had been tumbled inland over the town and now they drifted above the housetops on taut wings, whining peevishly. It was the sort of weather calculated to try anyone's endurance. Considered as a group, my family was not a very prepossessing sight that afternoon, for the weather had brought with it the usual selection of ills to which we were prone. For me, lying on the floor, labelling my collection of shells, it had brought catarrh, pouring into my skull like cement, so that I was forced to breathe stertorously through open mouth. For my brother Leslie, hunched, dark and glowering by the fire, it had inflamed the convolutions of his ears so that they bled delicately but persistently. To my sister Margot, it had delivered a fresh dappling of acne spots to a face that was already blotched like a red veil. For my mother, there was a rich bubbling cold and a twinge of rheumatism to season it. Only my eldest brother, Larry, was untouched but it was sufficient that he was irritated by our failings. It was Larry, of course, who started it. The rest of us felt too apathetic to think of anything except our own ills, but Larry was designed by Providence to go through life like a small blonde firework, exploding ideas in other people's minds and then curling up with cat-like unctuousness and refusing to take any blame for the consequences. He had become increasingly irritable as the afternoon wore on. At length, glancing moodily around the room, he decided to attack Mother as being the obvious cause of the trouble. Why do we stand this bloody climate? he asked suddenly, making a gesture towards the rain-distorted window. Look at it! And if it comes to that, look at us! Margot swollen up like a plate of scarlet porridge. Leslie wandering around with 14 fathoms of cotton wool in each ear. Jerry sounds as though he had a cleft palate from birth. And look at you. You're looking more decrepit and hag-ridden every day. Mother peered over the top of a large volume entitled Easy Recipes from Jabutana. Indeed I'm not, she said indignantly. You are, Larry insisted. You're beginning to look like an Irish washerwoman. And your family looks like a series of illustrations from a medical encyclopedia. Mother could think of no really crushing reply to this, so she contented herself with a glare before retreating once more behind her book. What we need is sunshine, Larry continued. Don't you agree, Les? 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 Leslie unravelled a large quantity of cotton wool from one ear. What do you say? he asked. There you are said Larry, turning triumphantly to Mother. It's become a major operation to hold a conversation with him. I ask you, what a position to be in. One brother can't hear what you say and the other one can't be understood. Really, it's time something was done. I can't be expected to produce deathless prose in an atmosphere of gloom and eucalyptus. Yes, dear, said Mother vaguely. What we all need, said Larry, getting into his stride again, is sunshine, a country where we can grow. Yes, dear, that would be nice, agreed Mother, not really listening. I had a letter from George this morning. He says Corfu's wonderful. Why do we pack up and go to Greece? Very well, dear, if you like, said Mother unguardedly. Where Larry was concerned, she was generally very careful not to commit herself. When? asked Larry, rather surprised at this cooperation. Mother, perceiving that she had made a tactical error, cautiously lowered easy recipes from Rajputana. Well, 
I think it would be a sensible idea if, if you were to go on ahead, dear, and, and arrange things. Then you can write and tell me if it's nice and we can all follow, she said cleverly. Lavery gave her a withering look. You said that when I suggested going to Spain, he reminded her, and I sat for two interminable months in Seville waiting for you to come out whilst you did nothing but except write me massive letters about drains and drinking water as though I were the town clerk or something. No, if we're going to Greece, let's all go together. You do exaggerate, Larry, said Mother plaintively. Anyway, I can't just go just like that. I, I have to arrange something about the house. Arrange? Arrange what, for heaven's sake? Sell it. I can't do that, dear, said Mother, shocked. But why? But I've only just bought it. Sell it while it's untarnished, then. Don't be ridiculous, dear, said Mother firmly. That's quite out of the question. It would be madness. So we sold the house and fled from the gloom of the English summer like a flock of migrating swallows. We all travelled light, taking with us only what we considered to be the bare essentials of life. And when we opened our luggage for customs inspection, the contents of our bags were a fair indication of character and interests. Thus, Margot's luggage contained a multitude of diaphanous garments, three books on slimming, and a regiment of small bottles, each containing some elixir guaranteed to cure acne. Leslie's case held a couple of roll-top pullovers and a pair of trousers which were wrapped around two revolvers, an air pistol, a book called Be Your Own Gunsmith, and a large bottle of oil that leaked. Larry was accompanied by two trunks of books and a briefcase containing his clothes. Mother's luggage was sensibly divided between clothes and various volumes on cooking and gardening. I travelled with only those items that I thought necessary to relieve the tedium of a long journey. Four books on natural history, a butterfly net, a dog and a jam jar full of caterpillars, all in imminent danger of turning into chrysalids. Thus, by our standards fully equipped, we left the clammy shores of England. France, rain-washed and sorrowful. Switzerland, like a Christmas cake. Italy, exuberant, noisy and smelly, were passed, leaving only confused memories. The tiny ship throbbed away from the heel of Italy out into the twilight sea, and as we slept in our stuffy cabins, somewhere in that tract of moon-polished water, we passed the invisible dividing line and entered the bright looking-glass world of Greece. Slowly, this sense of change seeped down to us, and so, at dawn, we awoke restless and went on deck. The sea lifted smooth blue muscles of wave as it stirred in the dawn light, and the foam of our wake spread gently behind us like a white peacock's tail, glinting with bubbles. The sky was pale and stained with yellow on the eastern horizon. Ahead lay a chocolate-brown smudge of land huddled in mist, with a frill of foam at its base. This was Corfu, and we strained our eyes to make out the exact shapes of the mountains, to discover valleys, peaks, ravines and beaches, but it remained a silhouette. Then suddenly the sun shifted over the horizon and the sky turned the smooth enamelled blue of a jay's eye. The endless, meticulous curves of the sea flamed for an instant and then changed to a deep royal purple flecked with green. The mist lifted in quick, lithe ribbons, and before us lay the island. The mountains as though sleeping beneath a crumpled blanket of brown, the folds stained with green of olive groves. Along the shore curved beaches as white as tusks among tottering cities of brilliant gold, red and white rocks. We rounded the northern cape, a smooth shoulder of rust-red cliff carved into a series of giant caves. The dark waves lifted our wake and carried it gently towards them, and then at their very mouths it crumpled and hissed thirstily among the rocks. Rounding the cape we left the mountains and the island sloped gently down, blurred with the silver and green iridescence of olives, 
with here and there an admonishing finger of black cypress against the sky. The shallow sea in the bays was butterfly blue, and even above the sound of the ship's engines we could hear, faintly ringing from the shore like a chorus of tiny voices, the shrill, triumphant cries of the cicadas. Thank you.